This conference will now be recorded. All right, you want me to do a quick roll? Uh, yeah, just one second, so let me just introduce it. So we got right at the front. Good morning, everybody. This is the RTD Accountability Committee Governance Subcommittee on Monday, September 28th, which is my brother's birthday, FYI. Um, and I'm calling this meeting to order. Um, Melinda, yes, if you wouldn't mind just reading uh, who's who's on the line. Absolutely. So we have Matthew Helfant, Melinda Stevens, Ron Papstorf, Bill Soroy, Kathy Nesbitt, Deborah Baskett, uh, Jaya Zavala, Douglas Rex, Eileen Yazzi, Elise Jones, Jackie Malay, Jordan Sanchez, uh, Josna Vishwar Karma, I'm so sorry, uh, Matt Callison, Paul Hamilton, Stephen Hounert, Troy Whitmore, and we actually do have another person who called in that, that I cannot see their name. Hey, can, I, can I ask you to identify yourself or introduce yourself, please, the callers? I know Kathy Ness, but is one. Correct. And is there another caller? Okay, all right, we'll go ahead. Um, so thank you all very much and good morning. Um, so we have for, for, for your review, the September 16th meeting summary. Um, it doesn't require an action or anything like that, being, it's being a subcommittee and kind of a working group. But if you have any uh, additions, corrections to that meeting summary, you're welcome to bring them up now. Or just, Share those with me uh, independently. Just, just shoot me a quick email or something. We'll make sure that the uh, the minutes are accurately reflected. Are there any comments on the on the summary right now? None for me. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. So with the um, so that item number three is refinement to the subcommittee objectives, and I just want it before we head into the kind of the meat of the program today is to. Uh, provide you an opportunity um, if if you so desire to kind of change any of the uh, subcommittee objectives that we currently have in place. Um, of course, this is fluid and you can change these at any time as we go forth, but we always um, staff want to provide an opportunity for you guys to have a look and see if there's anything on here that uh, that needs adjustment. I will go to the Next page, because that's a little cleaner for you guys. We, we okay for now? Looks good to me. Okay. Thank you all very much. Okay. So, um, you know, when we talked about the objectives last time, the, you know, we talked, you know, obviously being the governance committee and everything, we thought it'd be good to get a, kind of a foundation and just what RTD's governance is. And I know we have Director Whitmore that's on the line today, and um, he's he's forgotten more than uh, than I know about this issue. So Troy, feel more than comfortable and speaking up when it, whenever you feel um, the the necessity to do so to correct me if nothing else. Um, but we also so I. So I, I do, I want to give just a quick overview so everybody has kind of a, at least a foundational um, understanding of just some of the governance aspects associated with RTD. And then um, I mentioned to you guys last time that I spent 17 years in Oklahoma City and one of the tasks we undertook at the Association of Central Oklahoma Government, Governments when I was there in my latter years being there was um, we would start looking at governance um, for a regional transit agency. And um, it was called, the, the, the whole concept was called a regional transit dialogue with the community. And we explored a number of governance models throughout the country. And after I'd left, uh, um, there was a separate report that was on a white paper that was done by Holmes and Associates that I'm gonna share with you guys today. It kind of highlighted six models um, in their case studies that, um, that I just wanted to share with you. It's quite interesting. I think, quite frankly, this whole governance aspect is. It's pretty fascinating because there are just so many different models. Um, they're like fingerprints, right? There's never two, no two alike. So um, if it pleases the group, um, hi, Julie. I see Julie Duran Mullica is on the line now. Good to see you. Hey, how's it going? Thanks. <laughs> okay. So what I thought I'd do, I just run, I got a couple, three slides on RTD, and then we can get into um, that, that report from Oklahoma City. Just size of this real quick. So, so first, like I had mentioned, just kind of a brief overview of RTD's governance model. And then um, 
and then we'll talk about that Oklahoma City city model. So RTD governance, it was created back in 1969, and as you, with the RTD Act, it was, uh, it is a political subdivision of the state, which so many transit agencies are, actually more than I had actually thought. Um, so, uh, so it's not unique that uh, RTD is a, is a creature of the state. Um, it's a 15 member elected body representing the districts of, I'm doing air quotes here, equal population. Currently, it's about 180,000 people in each district. Um, that's according to the 2010 census. And this will be reevaluated, of course, after each decennial census. So there's a requirement, I think, um, in 2021, uh, RTD has a period of time in which they must submit and uh, what the new district boundaries based on the population will be. And if they're unable to meet that milestone, then I think something, something triggers and there's a State Department that possibly does that. Um, hey, everybody, just FYI, if I can't see your hands or anything, because I, um, so if you have a question or comment, just please just blurt it out. Because I, I, you know, share my screen, I can't see everybody. Just so, I just want to let you guys know. Um, and really, you know, as far as the the board itself, the RTD board, it has really two main functions. There's a governance function and a management function. The governance function, which is created by statute, creates it, it's the they're responsible for the creation of policy and strategic direction. That's no surprise to anybody. And they have a management function as well, um, although. The governance function is um, takes paramount for sure. They also approve financial uh, contracts and uh, fair structure as well as uh, general manager oversight. They have uh, six standing committees uh, and you can see those listed here on your screen. Um, Troy, let me ask you, which, which uh, do you chair or co-chair one of these or, or vice chair one of these committees, uh, Troy? Yeah, thanks, Doug. I um, vice chair of the uh, Communications and Government Relations Committee and uh, vice chair of the Fast Tracks um, uh, Operational Committee as well. Okay, great. Thanks, sir, very much. Um, so I think the important thing to remember with this is that, that with the exception of um, of the executive committee and the uh, general oversight committee, these are committees of the whole. Um, and there was a reason that this was this was done some years, you know, after their formation, of course. Um, and and the reason they did that was to provide provide time and opportunity for the full board to participate in each of them and acquire knowledge and voice constituency base uh, have representation of the constituency base because a lot of these are, as you can imagine, very complicated. And in order for the full board to have equal opportunity to learn and educate themselves on the various functions of RTD, they felt it necessary for the for the committees to be a committee a committees of the whole. So, Doug, can I just ask a follow up on that? Yeah. So, the with the exception of those two that you stated, yeah. um, every single board member, all fifteen of them, must participate or have the opportunity to participate in the committees it's my understanding that it they they must participate because the quorum is based on um total memberships although i think the quorum is relatively low though jackie it's like uh like five i believe is that right troy well um first of all back to original question i really wasn't given an option about attendance at those meetings <laughs> jackie it pretty much yeah. understood um and the reason that we meet so many Tuesday nights is because three out of the four Tuesdays, we are in committees of the whole. And so it's not unlike a little bit like the legislative process where that's kind of like the committee structure um, and committee hearings uh, before it goes to the floor, although the committee's the same as the whole board. So, for instance, we have board meeting tomorrow night but we've had committee meetings every other Tuesday. Um, but yeah, there is a little more of a restriction on some of the um, um, approval processes. There's some motions where we have to have 10 uh, to pass and most of them it, it's eight, but uh, the quorum requirement does drop a 
little bit, as Doug mentioned. I'm not sure quite what that is. I can't recall, Doug, but but you're right. But that happens very seldom. We tend to have very good uh, attendance at all the committee meetings. Hopefully that helped a little bit. Yeah, thanks. They're just, they're just very large committees, and most of us that are uh, part of city councils or other um, governments have, have smaller uh, and allow a little more detail by a smaller group of the body to get into the weeds a little bit and then present it to the full body uh, before um, a final decision is made. And, and to me, getting 15 people together for each of those is, is, is somewhat ambitious. And, and I'm, I'm wondering if it's the most efficient use of timing, but regardless, I wanted to understand why you, why you chose to do it that way. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've had some limited discussions of that very item, but we tend to uh, spend more time in committee meetings than we do at the actual board meeting because a lot of the getting into the weeds, if you will, does happen with all 15 of us um, present. I'm sure there's some nodding heads from some of the RTD staff members that are on the call. Thanks. <laughs> Doug. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Dea? Yes. I had a quick question going back one slide on um, on the representation per district, um, I don't think we have to go too far into this right now, but I'm just curious if we can, if we might be able to get an update from from um, either Dr. Cog's staff on what the approximate number of folks within each of the districts currently is ahead of the 20. I know we have a census coming up this year, but if we can just get a sense of of what the current population looks like per district, that would be helpful. Oh sure, yeah, we could. I'm sure we could do that pretty pretty readily. I'm just right now. I, oh, go I ahead. believe because I was reading it. I was reading it the other day. I'm not 100% positive, but I'm like 90% positive. I remember seeing 180,000. Uh, Doug, it's Angie. Um, yes, Angie. Currently, the estimation is right around 220,000 constituents per district for a total of about 3 million. Oh, very good. Thank you, Angie, very much. Um, Hi, Eileen Yazi. Um, I'm a member of the public. I'm actually, I work for City County of Denver. I'm one of the planning managers there. Hi, Eileen. Hi, how are you doing? Um, I posted a question in the in the chat, and this is kind of a little bit in the weeds, but I, I think it could be helpful for this discussion, um, is so part of, you know, federal, um, you know, the planning function for regional you know, transportation agencies is to kind of obviously do transportation planning, which includes transit. And I have a question between RTE governance and Dr. Cog governance. Um, is there a specification of who does transit planning? Um, because going back to the previous slide, it looks like RTD's governance is focused in on, um, it, it doesn't, if you go to the previous slide, I don't know if it necessarily says that RTD is governed to plan. It says policy and strategic direction and financial approvals of contracts fair. So between the two agencies, Dr. Cog and RTD, is it clearly defined of where transit planning is, who's responsible for that? Yeah, th that's a really good question. Um, so with regards to our planning responsibilities as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, which is a federally designated um, um, de designation, you know, we are required to provide a, a regional transportation plan for at least a 20 year horizon for all modes of transportation within, within, this, within our region. Um, I think from RTD's perspective, and I would, I would entertain um, any comments from RTD staff or Director Whitmore on this, that, um, that you know, I think the planning that they do is they do have a planning department, as you know, and they, um, you know, it's more operational based in a lot of respects but they also plan on the land use side through their, their transit-oriented development um, section within, within the planning branch. And um, I know they do some long-range planning as well. And they do that in concert with us at, at Dr. Cog to fulfill our, our uh, federal responsibilities in that respect. Bill Soroy, or I don't know if Bill Van Meter, someone's on the line that might wanna. Hey, Doug, this is, this is Ron Pepsdorf. Eileen, thanks for the question. I, maybe I'll just supplement a little bit what Doug said because um, Absolutely correct. Dr. Cog is, as the designated metropolitan planning organization responsible for overseeing the long range planning processes. 
responsible for long-range multimodal transportation planning. But that is a very but under federal law and regulations, that's a cooperative continuing process that involves Dr. Cog as the lead MPO agency with the transit agency, in this case RTD, and the state DOT, um, in our case, Colorado Department of Transportation. So it's not any one agency doing its own thing. It is very much a cooperative process. Dr. Cog's focus is definitely sort of the long range multimodal planning, whereas each of the individual agencies is sort of more responsible for and you know and takes the lead on the nearer term sort of service planning. So Dr. Cog doesn't really play a role in directly in sort of the the near term service planning that RTD does, but all of RTD's work, just like CDOT's work, and just like the city and county of Denver's work, works within a regional framework that's established by the MPO and the regional planning process, which is a multiple agency process. Thanks for that clarification. And then also, um, I know that uh, a lot of uh, the teammates from Dr. Cog know, um, more than happy to share though with everybody. Um, uh, I came to Metro Denver just only about three years ago uh, from Metro Phoenix. Um, I worked at the MPO there, MAG, the Maricopa Association of Governments. And then I also worked at the city of Phoenix, both in the street and the transit department. Um, so I'm more than happy to share when we get to that um, governance structures, kind of how Valley Metro and Metro Phoenix and the regional agency work together. Yeah, that's fab, fab. It's like, I mean, thank you very much. And I'm hoping to, le to lean on Ron a little bit too when we talk about Portland here in a second. Um, Ron, I haven't told you that, FYI. <laughs> so that's the committee. So one thing I will say about, you know, committees as a whole, um, there's, there are some efficiencies that I, this is me personally, I think, because you know, uh, to Troy's point is like the, the actual RTD board meetings then, because if they have a unanimous decision on an item at the, at the within the standing committee, um, that then goes on consent on the RTD board um, board packet. It's, it, and I don't know if that's more policy than rule or, or of what, but I, but I think that's, um, that, you know, I, I think that's a great idea. So there is a lot of discussion, um, but it is unique for sure to have all members serve on all those committees. That's a that's a lot of lot of time for sure. Okay, are, are there any question? Any other questions on RTD's governance right now? Okay, so what I really would like to do, and I'm going to do this rather quickly because I do, you know, these meetings are only an hour, and I would like to provide an opportunity to get some further direction and discussion from you all is um, just to go through the three, the six case studies that um, Holmes and Associates did for, for the uh, our Oklahoma City counterpart, the Association of Central Oklahoma Governments. Um, and because several of them are very unique, just bear with me here real quick. So the report itself, um, it has, you know, in the introductory is very Oklahoma City centric so i'm going to skip over that and go right to the actual um where they start talking about the case studies okay so the first one they talked about is is dallas area rapid transit or dart and let me catch up real quick here and you will you'll recognize in this that but they're truly, you know, there's very, these all six are very distinct um, examples of transit governance. So DART, for example, um, let's see here, was initiated in, uh, in 1993 through state statute. And uh, it, um, it actually has a one cent sales tax associated. So that's their revenue source on this, which kind of limits the, and um, you know the number of cities that can actually join because there's a there's a cap in in, in Texas state law that um, that you know your sales tax can't be up above a certain amount and there are communities that have already hit that cap. Um, their service area is um, represented by 13 cities within the Dallas Fort Worth area and if as you know um, you know those that are familiar with Dallas Fort Worth I mean I know NCT Cog who's our counterpart down there I mean it's like. 300 communities or something like that. I mean, the Metroplex is just huge. So these are really just, you know, kind of the core cities within, within that metropolitan area. Um, 
you know, I do know, and this is represented by a statement right here at the end. I don't know if you can see my cursor, but the North Central Texas uh, Council of Governments, as I just mentioned, they, they, they play a significant role. They share planning resources, and, um, and it seems to work pretty well down there in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. You will notice there's a theme throughout this that suggests um, you know, um, most of the boards, I think all the boards of the six anyway, um, have a degree or an element of, a, of appointed boards and DART is no different. DART is a governing, a governing board of 15 members which are appointed by the member jurisdictions and is population based. So um, depending on how much population you have within your community, the, uh, you know, so, so like Dallas proper, for example, they will have more votes than most other communities on there simply because of their share population. And I thought what, what was interesting aspect of this is that community, smaller communities within the Metroplex that are part of DART, that they can pool their population and share a vote, um, and which, has been, which is certainly the case. And that is what they do currently. Um, so that's all I really wanted to share with them. They do not, DART does not operate um, all their modes, of, uh, transit modes of, uh, of um, uh, all their transit modes within that within their corridor within their region. Um, they do not. They do not operate uh, commuter rail. Commuter rail is operated by Trinity Rapid Express, and that's commuter rail from basically Dallas proper to Fort Worth. And uh, so that that that's a uniqueness to them as well. Any questions on Dallas Fort Worth? Okay. The next one is uh, Valley Metro, and I know Eileen's on the phone, so Eileen, feel free to chime in here. But this is um, very unique to the other other five that are mentioned here because it it's formed. It's really kind of an umbrella um, association. Um, it basically what it does it unifies the brand. So a lot of the actual uh, bus operations is uh, provided by local governments. In, in in the in the Phoenix area, and this and you know what they what they found and the reason why they formed formed Valley Metro is that there was a lot of confusion um, with regards to branding. Right, if each community is running their own separate service, it was there was confusion amongst the regional population. So Valley Metro really has there's two boards that are under Valley Metro, and that is the um, the the Rapta board. Which, which Valley Metro RPTA, which is responsible for bus operations and, and Metro Rail or Metro, which operates light rail. Um, let me see, what else did I wanna mention about this? Uh, so- hey, so yeah. hey Rex, is it okay yeah. if, I, if I chime in a little bit? Please. Yeah, sure. So one thing I, I think that as, as Rex mentioned is about the um, diverse uh, funding partners that support transit and that really you know to echo what Rex said so the short is in 1985 that half cent sales tax it said there's five million dollars per year so out of that half cent sales tax if you think of that as 100 percent only about three percent went to regional transit so I'm going to set the stage with that so that's actually what it means it was three percent of that of that half cent sales tax went to regional transit so on that um all of the local agencies said, well, we can't get our, our regional power to support transit. So that's why Scottsdale went by itself, Tempe, Mesa, and then Phoenix in 2000, um, they also went for a, uh, a, their own dedicated sales tax um, or a percentage of their sales tax for transit. And back before that, City of Phoenix was using their general fund to support transit. On that, since there was no real operations of Valley Metro in 1985, City of Phoenix um, became the designated recipient for FTA funds because of their the size of their transit agency. On that, um, kind of in 2004, when the next half sales tax was passed, um, a third of that 100% half cent sales tax of the region, it, one county, um, which in, incorporates at that time all of RTD or in the in the area and all of um, the Metropolitan Planning Agency, which is MAG. Um, then it, it jumped up to a third 
and that mainly was to support um, regional bus operations and the capital side of light rail. Um, I will note all local agencies, they um, fund the operations of light rail that is not funded by the regional agency or any regional agency. Um, so that kind of also dictates the very localized drive. One thing I will note is with all of this, all of these different funding sources, and I will say they have, there has been a, a, a consolidation of some of the operators. Tempe consolidated under um, Valley Metro to run all of their service. They handed over their um, buses, maintenance operations things to the um, regional transit agency. City of Phoenix is still the owner and operator of the largest um, bus system in the, in the region. That said, um, the regional agency, the Regional Transportation Planning Agency, MAG, Maricopa Association of Governments, they have um, two MOUs, uh, Memorandum of Understanding or IGAs, I think they're IGAs, um, I, I set them up um, or had to renew them, um, with Valley Metro and with City of Phoenix and Valley Metro, they're two separate ones related to governance of transportation planning, transportation finance, um, and financials, um, governance, operations, um, and then kind of reporting. Um, so there are IGAs set up, and on that, the regional agency, the MPO, has a very large role in the transit planning. They are the lead. Um, so they're, they're the lead that works in coordination, obviously, with Valley Metro and City of Phoenix. A lot of their sub-area planning studies um, are done in conjunction with both agencies, but usually they're let out of the regional agency. Um, it all depends. Um, and then it, there's tons of nuances, but that's hopefully I didn't talk too long. Thank no, you. No, thank you very much. No, that's really good. I, I don't know if anybody had any questions specific to uh, to Phoenix for Eileen. Thank you very much. No, that, that was very useful information. I, it is very unique that, you know, with within Valley Metro itself, you know, being that umbrella that it has two very distinct boards, right? Um, yeah, and, it, and it's really related to that operations funding of the light rail side of the house. So since yeah. it's all in the local agencies to fund the operations of, of that um, light rail, that's why it's kind of set up as two individual um, boards. Gotcha. No, thank you very much. Appreciate that. Um, okay, let's go to uh, TriMet. So TriMet is um, is a transit agency in in Portland, Portland area. Um, there's a seven member board which is which is also appointed, um, and they're they're very unique in that they they their funding source their revenue stream is payroll tax. Um, Oregon doesn't have sales tax, so it's um, so it's so I think that's quite interesting. It was established back in 1969, and um, uh, it's uh, it's actually their governance is a is a it's a little different too. Um, they actually have so this governance of the actual streetcar is done primarily by the city of Portland, and um, and there's they have this third party nonprofit corporation called PSI, which provides the administrative support and, re and responsibilities for for that board, um, and also and then TriMet then provides kind of the operators and mechanics and everything. So they basically provide kind of the operations. Ron, did you have anything specific on on, uh, on the Portland model that you wanted to point out to the group? Oh, just uh, maybe I'll just um, throw in a few details. Um, so as Doug said, the, the TriMet Board of Directors is, um, is an appointed board, uh, geographically appointed by the governor, um, uh, ratified by the state senate, uh, so, it, you know, those appointments happen at the state level uh, because TriMet, it, like like RTD, is sort of a subdivision of the state, a, statu a, a creature of, of state statute. So uh, that's the linkage to how districts are appointed uh, or the board members are appointed. The board members, as I said, are are appointed geographically. So the refer that the person that fills a board seat has to reside within a certain geographic area. So the, the board the board um, seats are geographically based within the TriMet area. Uh, I'll also point out there is a there is a second, not nearly as large transit agency in the south part of the Portland metro area called SMART, which covers uh, kind of a suburban area of, of Portland uh, to the south. 
Um, so those two agencies have to kind of coordinate with each other a bit and with the regional agency. Um, on the planning side, very much a, a cooperative effort between the Portland MPO, which is um, Metro, and RTD as the, as the transit agency. And as a matter of fact, uh, some of the, and they have a fairly extensive light rail system, uh, so light rail corridor studies uh, usually are jointly led between the MPO and uh, the transit agency, uh, sometimes led uh, exclusively by, with just participation uh, by the transit agency uh, and led exclusively by the MPO. So the MPO takes a more active role in sort of a lot of the uh, specific project planning efforts and, and environmental uh, clearance efforts through NEPA. Um, the the streetcar issue is pretty interesting in Portland. So uh, Portland was a kind of a national leader in the sort of resurgence of streetcar around the country. They were one of the one of the early ad local adopters of kind of bringing streetcar back as a major uh, trans transportation mode. Um, and you know they had some they had some pretty strong political uh, support and leadership uh, at the congressional level uh, back when streetcar was going, which is why the city of Portland sort of started this quasi-governmental Portland Streetcar Inc. PSI, as Doug Doug mentioned. Um, and PSI basically kind of took the lead in developing this, the first streetcar lines and then contracts with TriMet to do to kind of do the operations uh, through through agreement. Um, the funding mechanism for streetcar has largely been some federal grants, but leveraged really extensively with um, sort of um, improvement district uh, funds. So at kind of a value capture sort of, sort of funding mechanism. So as uh, kind of drew a border around the initial streetcar line, uh, did a special sort of assessment and value capture method to, to capture increased uh, tax revenue to repay bonds that that helped leverage some some federal grants to to build streetcars. So that's been pretty interesting. That's that mechanism has also been used to some extent for some of their light rail line for some of the light rail lines in transit. So it's not just been sort of local local tax revenue, but also sort of value capture methods to help leverage a number of federal grants. Um, happy to answer any questions um, about that, but just wanted to kind of add a little bit, a little bit of flesh to the to the skeleton there. Yeah, thanks, Ron, very much. No, that was that was fantastic. Any comments of Ron on the Portland model? Okay, so San Diego, San Diego. Um, so this model, so San Diego, so you know, is is our counterpart, Dr. Cog's counterpart in in San Diego. They're the Metropolitan Planning Organization and, and quite frankly, Council of Governments for, for that region. Um, so, so they actually, so the actual decisions associated with, with planning of, for, um, for any type of public transportation is done through SANDAG. Now, the, the important thing to point out with, with SANDAG is that they do not operate transit. So once, so once, um, uh, you know the um, so so the forms so it basically so Sandeg operates as a form for for regional decision making right for transportation land use um, all the regional growth and development public transportation those types of things so it's a consensus building organization such as Dr Cog right so once that's all determined and there's funding then uh, associated and allocated out to projects then um, then the operations and maintenance of those specific systems are then turned to a third party. And um, they even note in here, so for example, MTS operates and maintains the bus and rail services within the greater San Diego area, um, as well as like Amtrak operates the, the coaster commuter rail in the Sandag area as well. So that, that's, a, that's a unique model in which the MPO has a more direct hand in the uh, decision-making process associated with, they have a 15-member board, um, and again, it's selected. So I, I guess it's selected versus, I mean, is appoint, appointed again. I mean, they're not. I mean, they're elected officials, but not elected to serve on the board. They're selected from uh, mayors, council members, and um, county supervisors slash commissioners within within the local governments in the region. Are there any questions or comments about San Diego? Okay. 
Hey, Doug, it's Jackie. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm curious about this model where these 15 member boards are selected by their peers. So, it, so it's comparable to COG. It would be the COG, Dr. COG member body identifying 15. And is there any geographic requirement? And then how long do they serve? The ter what's the term? Uh, I'm not sure on the term, Jackie, but I, I do know that, uh, yes, yeah, so it's based, so each community within, so it's basically the setup, so it, the setup is similar to like doc, how Dr. Cog is uh, mayor. So each each community gets one member, one member, and that's selected from either their mayor makes that appointment or as you know, as a, as a council decision. Okay, it's not a subset then of a Cog right. board or an NPO board. It is not. Okay, thank you. And then the terms are are uh, the defined by then the the community that sends the representative forward. I, I believe that. Well, that makes sense. I, and I can confirm yeah. that. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me see Utah. So Utah Transit Authority or UTA is um, it's a very gov it's very traditional governance um, model, I believe. So basically, within you within this within their district, and it serves like 80% of the population um, across the Wasatch Front um, within Utah. Uh, it serves 77 municipalities, seven counties, so it's very similar to the R to RTD and the current model that we have in place here. Doug, um, yes, Doug, this is Bill Soroy. Th this model is no longer in place, actually. Oh, um, it's not. No. I, and I'll give you a little background. So UTA went through um, some a level of controversy in the last few years. Um, they have a new model, which is very unique because they have a three person board, which is appointed by the governor who are actually paid staff of the agency. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is a wholly unique model. I, I don't know a lot more than that. I know that the, the, the appointed Board members are actually represent, I think, counties, different counties within the the service area, but it is it's a unique thing, and it, it really is gener was generated. Um, this change was generated by some controversy within the agency surrounding um, some of their board members' involvement in development on UTA property. Oh, so, very good. And that, I think it's only it's, it's only been the last two maybe two years that this has been in place, so it is very new. Yeah, thank you, Bill, very much. We'll do some additional research on it. Yeah, I mean, even the narrative suggests that there were, there was, you know, there appeared to be some some tension, let's say, with the, you know, with the governor's office and and the agency itself, to the extent that, um, you know, at least in the old model, there was, you know, 15 voting members of which, um, the 16 total, the the, the governor appointed one, which is non-voting, but they did, even in the narrative, it, it suggests that um, that there was conversations about how this the state could be more actively involved in UTA, which I thought was interesting. Thank you, Bill, very much. We'll do some additional research on that. Yeah, that's that's the fair with doing a report of, uh, was that was uh, done in November of 2017. A lot of changes. Um, hey, Doug, it would be interesting to understand outside of it sounds like some potential um, development in proprieties, if there were any other reasons for that entity to have changed that what why they changed was it just scandal related or did they have some um higher goal in mind uh, in yeah. addition to that yeah right i do know the narrative talks about in order for them to complete the projects that they were um they, they wanted to complete that they had to reach out and get some state monies um and so the state funding came with some you know some the state has some leverage at that point, I believe, and they 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 wanted to have a look at their governance then. But I will, Jackie, for sure. We'll look out and and see what we can find. Some additional information on that. Uh, last but not least, I'm oh, way over my time. But last but not least is um, the Southeast Detroit or Southeast Michigan model or Detroit, um, and they're they're um, they have they have a ten member board. Um, nine of which are voting, but I, I'd like to, the the takeaway for me on this one was basically what was in the sidebar here. Um, I thought this was quite, quite frankly, it was very interesting in how they they decided how they appointed their board. Um, you know that, for example, and it's it's appointed by the governor. 
I believe. No, they're not. So there's two members that are appointed by the county executive of the county, second largest population. Two members are appointed by the county executive, the third largest population. Two members appointed by the fourth. Two members appointed. Oh, so they're, they're all county appointments with the exception of the governor's appointee. But they had certain criteria that they used to come up with those appointments, and they're listed in in the in this uh, sidebar. Um, you know, they they tried to get some representation of um, certain skill sets, such as financial skill sets, business background, transit background, for example. Um, they also wanted uh, persons that were independent of municipalities to serve. So, so quite frankly, not elected officials, I would assume. Um, board members that are uh, that that represent the entire region. Um, they want a diverse board based on gender, race, and ethnic background. And uh, but ultimately, it says here the board is responsible for the financial performance of the transit system. So I, I thought that was that was pretty pretty unique in um, you know how appointments were um, you know specifically you know have specific criteria to do something like that I thought was interesting and um, and quite frankly that's that's kind of the end of that I, I'd be willing to take any questions or open it up to the group for further conversation and discussion and quite frankly any further direction comments questions you would like us to address yes Julie I have a question. So I'm, I'm thinking over this information and I, I like, um, thank you for sharing all of these different um, types of setups because I, I think it's important just to kind of get an idea of, of different types of governance structures. But one of the questions that I keep getting back to is, um, you know, what problem are we trying to solve here right now with, with our structure in RTD? What is it that we feel like we're lacking or that we need to change? Um, because I feel like all of these structures are so unique in its own way. Um, so what is it that we need to do to perhaps maybe adopt or kind of play off of um, some of these other models um, to achieve what we need RTD to be, right? Is, is That's kind of the point of this conversation. And so that's what I'm just kind of struggling with. Um, and. Uh, and I'm just gonna throw it out there. It's just one of the ideas I was thinking about right away is um, I, I think more, one of the things we've heard about a lot is that tie to local officials and how are we bringing in our locals elected into this process of RTD and how it's working. Um, the, that's one of the things that I, I wish could be um, better uh, through the governance of RTD. Um, but I wanted to pose that question out to other members of this group of, you know, what is it that we're seeking? Um, and, and what are some of those things that we we are wishing to, to adopt or I don't know, semi-adopt or any way that we can? So I was just kind of hoping I could hear from some of the other members as well. No, that's fabulous, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, does anybody have any comments? Uh, suggestions associated with Julie's question about what problem is it we're, we're truly trying to solve here? All right, well, it's Kathy. You know, I don't know that there is a problem, but I just think it would be important for us to understand what other models exist and are there pros and cons associated with each of those? I didn't ask the, you know, the pros and cons during this. I figured we'd have some time to discuss that later, but it would be important for me to understand um, you know, how quickly business gets done in each of these different structures and models, how are they managing the leadership team, et cetera. So those are my, my general um, questions and, and thoughts about, I don't know if it's a problem, but just more of an assessment, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I guess I, this is Elise. I, if you want to, if you're asking me what problem we're trying to solve with RTD, um, I mean, I think there are a couple. <laughs> major ones. Financially, RTD is in a bit of a financial tailspin um, and I, I, is not in a financially sustainable place nor capable of, of um, being able to afford to finish um, fast tracks um, or sustainably operate um, the lines it's created under fast tracks. 
that's one. B, it, um, the, the governance structure is related to that from a financial standpoint, but also at different times, I, I, I think you could argue the RTD board has been more effective than not. I would say we're, we're in a pretty good place with the RTD board right now, but in the past, um, I, if I'm just going to be frank, we've had um, uh, RTD board members that are openly hostile to transit, which calls into question why they're on the board to oversee the, the largest transit agency in the state. Um, so I think there, without a doubt, we could say that RTD has room for improvement in terms of efficiency and effectiveness. Uh, and uh, there is a lack of trust um, between many of the communities that RTD serves and the RTD agency. So those are all things I think we're trying to fix. Governance is not necessarily going to be the source of all those solutions but it's the framework on which um, you know the organization hangs and so it's pretty important and looking at different ways to structure and finance the organization I, I, I think is a key part of this exploration my one question would be in terms of the I'm six sorry, can role, I, can uh, I... models oh go ahead I was going to say my response was because I thought the context of the question was in governance so I wasn't talking about RTD overall, just FYI. Thank hey, Kathy. Go ahead, Elise. Fair enough. I... No, go ahead, Elise. Um, I, my question was about this six um, different examples that were brought forth in the report. How were they chosen? Are they the most, does this cover the entire range of models? Or are they the most successful? Or how did how and maybe you explained that at the beginning and I missed it, but why these six? Yeah, um, so no, these I mean these does they don't run the gamut. I think you know, from you know, they they kind of looked at um, some different quantitative and qualitative measures that they wanted to use, um, including regional population, transit modes, uh, modes, complexity, and use of strategies to effectuate regionalism. I'm reading right from the report, Lee. So so that was kind of what they used. There are, of course, other models and complexities of, of, uh, of similar type models that are out there. Um, and we'd be happy to explore anything and everything that you guys would like us to. Because it might be useful to sort of put together a matrix that shows these and see if there are other sort of nominations for unique or highly successful governance structures that we should look at as well and sort of have them in a matrix chart so you could look at the different ways, for example, you know, how big is their boards, how are the boards created, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so this report um, started, it developed a matrix associated with some of that stuff, but we can build up on that, of course, and and uh, look at some other uh, other uh, regions around the country too. So I, I would be really, oops, sorry, go ahead, Elise. No, she's muted. Uh, uh, well, Doug, I would be interested in, in uh, learning where Oklahoma ended up after going through all of this, what model they, they ended up selecting. And then going back to the governance question, the very good question Julie raised is what, what is it we're trying to accomplish? I think one of the challenges with a 15 member elected geographically based board is what we all face as elected officials is what have we brought back to our community? Um, what have I accomplished in my individual role when they sent me down to Dr. Cog uh, to represent Lone Tree? What am I bringing back to my city was more important at points than what are we regionally accomplishing? And I think that that is a challenge that we all, we all face um, within our wards or our districts on our, on our councils or that the RTD board faces. So uh, did you bring back to us what somebody else in another geographic area got? And how do we prioritize the regional responsibility and the regional requirements of what we're trying to accomplish over the parochial interests that we all have when we go down and serve? And, and, and I'm interested in this, uh, the Southeast Michigan model in the sense of the county appointing two, 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 and two, and then, you know, I'm interested in all of them. And is there, is there a way to uh, uh, lessen the parochialism at, at times and think of the region as the whole? And I think while I was down at Dr. Cog, we did some great work at looking at the, 
how we're allocating dollars regionally first and then going back into the counties to let them have some flexibility. And I can't help but wonder if something along those lines might make sense at COD, where we first take, I mean, excuse me, at RTD, where we first take care of the entire region, but then pieces of it are sent back into the, the local jurisdictions um, to create and solve problems that are unique to the different communities. You know, the challenges that Douglas County faces with transit are not the same as what Denver is facing. So anyway, the, 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 back to that, I'm just big picture. I'm interested in exploring that. I don't know that I have the answer, but well, I think I do. You know me. I think I do. But I'm interested <laughs> in having I'm interested in you all uh, hearing what you all think about that. Thank you, ma'am. Julie. So I want to jump in and um, I actually would like to also explore Jackie's idea. I think it's um, I, I think it's a I when, when I was kind of going through these different um, models, I was kind of thinking along the same track as her. Um, and so I, I agree something like that might be interesting to kind of look at. And I know that um, you know, everyone likes to rave about how successful the last tip process was. Everybody loved it. Um, or at least everyone in my area loved it. Um, and so, um, you know, we were able to come together and, and locally make decisions that, that matter to, you know, our county. And so, um, I, I don't know, that process worked really well. And I think that um, if there's a, a way to incorporate that somehow, that would be great. Um, so yeah, I, I just want to second Jackie on that idea. I, I like it a lot. Great, thank you. Thank you, Julie, very much. Um, yeah, and I know we've had at least some, you know, cursory conversations about this, right, with regards to, you know, the operations and maintenance of a trunk system, a regional trunk system, you know, kind of operated by RTD, and then what are the conversations that could occur at, let's say, a sub-regional basis to help um, and collaborate with RTD to provide services, you know, kind of tributaries to that trunk system. Um, yeah, I, and we'd be more than happy to, you know, provide a you know, provide the framework for that conversation that's so desired and it sounds like it is. Any hey, other Doug, this is Elise and I have to jump off. I've been throwing some stuff in the uh, chat. Uh, okay. One is that um, we should take a look at LA Metro. I think it recently won, uh, underwent a governance transformation that might be useful to hear about. Okay, great. And, uh, and I really appreciate you bringing these models and I would agree with Julie and Jackie on their last points and I'm sorry I have to drop off early. So thanks everyone. That sounds good. Thank you, Commissioner, very much. Um, we're getting close to time anyway. Um, so at the next meeting and forgive me, I don't even know when that is. We got so many of these meetings going on right now, um, but I think it's after our next full meeting. Melinda, is that right? If you're on the line? That sounds um, correct. Yeah, so um, so we'll do some additional research, uh, particularly, you know, look at a couple of additional ones that were suggested in chat, and then we'll try to provide some type of framework to have the conversation that, that both Julie and Jackie um, had mentioned. How about that? Sound good? Okay. Um, any, other, any other matters of the group you want to bring forth before we take off for the day? One thing I was going to say, Doug, is um, I we did kind of pass through um, the RTD map as it stands today. It might be good to kind of just throw that back in in the next conversation and just kind of relook at um, where our map is. I mean, RTD doesn't cover all of the counties. Some, I think, cities might even be cut off. And so um, that could just be a point of discussion in the future. Of I'm just kind of interested how it got laid out the way it did. So yeah, sure. A little history perfect. That would be helpful too. perfect. I'll be sure to do so. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you all very, very much. Appreciate you guys being here on an early Monday morning and uh, look forward to seeing you guys real soon. So have a great day, great week. Take care.